We want to thank God as we're coming to the end of the book of First Thessalonians, and I was preparing the message as God speaks to me to His Word, the living Word of God. And I'm so excited to know that God is still relevant. You know, way back, you know, thousands of years ago, God still speaks to His Word. And His Word is always relevant, on time for all of us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as He asks God to speak to us personally and I'll have a message to take home with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning as we come and get in your presence here again, Lord, to encourage one another and be inspired by your word, Lord, to stir one another, Lord, in greater depth of love and service for you and to become a living testimony. Lord, you have called each one of us, Lord, to be living Christians. Lord, Christians, Lord, they are highly contagious and encouraging to others. So the Father, we build our family of God and encourage one another and then we reach out to others in our contagious lifestyle that others may see us and see Christ living in us and want and have this desire in the heart to want to be one of us, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning as we wrap up the book. Lord, the first letter, probably the oldest letter Paul has ever written to his beloved believers in Thessalonica, may also speak to all of us this morning. Lord, when you say goodbye to them, and Lord, I mean, this word may inspire us, Lord, how to live together as God's family. And Father, we give thanks, Lord, and ask that you give us, Lord, understanding and attentiveness to listen to your word. Because it is your word, and we want to hear it. And this, Father, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know what habit you have. I have some habit on my own. <clears throat> I love to collect photos, and especially call photos of my family. No, I, I, I think the trouble to go all the way back to collect my parents' photograph in black and white, my sisters, you know, and all the way through. And I take the trouble to sort it out by years, and then by occasion, events, and by name, so that one day when I walk down the memory lane, I will recall some of this precious moment. And as I look through the books on my album, I'm so satisfied to see something that's happened in my life. Because it brings back a lot. Uh, some memory of our choices. I know there's some choices that we make, uh, we are glad. And there's some choices that we make in our life that we regret, right? And all these photos are actually memory of things that we have decided to do. And I was saw through some of those photographs, you know, I see many things that have happened, you know, and I see my children grow from one milestone to the other and see them, you know, rise up from one occasion to the others, you know, and I see all of them, my heart re just rejoice. And I thank God, you know, maybe I keep a pat on my shoulder, God, I'm glad I made some right choices in my life. But I must say, there was a moment that I regret. Why I regret? Because I also make some wrong choices in my life, you know. And I don't stop there. And I told the Lord, I'm going to learn from it so that, you know, I will make correction to my own mistakes. I'm sure all of us make choices. And I want that one day I will leave behind to my children some of those choices I made, right? some wisdom that I gather over the years so that it will be something for them to hold on to and teach them, them to make choices that really count. Likewise for Paul. Paul too concludes in his first letter to the Thessalonians. And when he Think about them, I'm sure Paul can smile because there's so much thing he can thank God for, for this Thessalonian. And we have been digesting Paul's letter to the Thessalonians 
in the big size chunk, you know. I love to preach, you know, I, and preach, you know, in expository, you know, going from words to words, you know, from paragraph to paragraph, so that we preach the whole counsel of God. And going through all of these as we work through these five chapters, you know, they, they, I can see that I can appreciate how Paul value relationship with this early Christian. And repeatedly, we found this section of the scripture to be right on target. Right on target, you know, right, in speaking to the need and also speaking to our needs as well. Now, the Word of God is not only just for a certain group of people. It's just for us as well. And now, as we come to the end of the letter, we will discover that even when Paul said goodbye, Goodbye to this beloved fan. He provides provocative and also relevant truth for us to chew on. So this morning, as he say goodbye, let us, let us not miss this precious word. And let us be prepared ourselves to confront this information that will make us think. Not only think, but turn our attentions to the Lord that show us how that we can be better Christians living together in God's family. So let's begin this morning by reviewing. We have gone through five chapters. Let's go through a brief review, the letter as a whole, huh? so you can travel through and see how God speaks to all of us. I'm sure all of us who are parents and all of us who are mothers, I must say as parent mothers, you know, and especially if you have more than one child and those have less than, or with just one one, right, you don't feel it. But for those who have more than one child, we often feel that we have a special bond with the first one that we don't have with the others. Now, I'm not saying that mother don't love those who follow after them, but that is a very special bond that we have with daughters and as all the first child that we don't have with them. But I love all of them because of the time I spend in a bonding with them. I remember being a first parent, you know, and then the amount of time he invested in it, you know, had built a very special bond. And the same kind of relationship often occur in the spiritual realm between Christians and especially those who have you follow up in the first time and those people you have invested you no know, sacrificially in their life, you build a very special bond. And apparently Paul had this special bond of affections with these Thessalonian believers. Now let's see how is it. We have seen this again and again as we walk through the book of First Thessalonians. Now, how do we see it? You know, in chapter 1, we see Paul give thanks for this. There must be a reason why he gives thanks for them. And in moving to chapter 2, we find that he expressed his love for them. He openly expressed you know, how much Paul loved them. And moving to chapter 3, he began to say that he shared his concern for them. And because you love someone, right? You're concerned. You're not concerned, probably you don't have much love. But because he's concerned, he shows so much love and concern for them to ensure that he will continue to grow. They will not stop there. And then from there, he moved to chapter 4, all the way on. Finally, his love led him to flow up exhortation. Exhort them, not necessarily, but encourage them so that they will continue to run the journey. And obviously, we see from all of these verses here that the Thessalonian Christians were very, very close to Paul's heart. And so, coming to the end of this letter, Paul had to give a profound farewell speaking from his heart, as a writer will ever write to a friend. This is different, different kind of letters, right? It's a friend. You want to write something huh, that is really concerned, you know, you express your heart. When you feel towards someone, deeply you feel someone, especially Paul did toward the Thessalonians, it can be very hard for us to say goodbye. 
we don't want to say the word goodbye. We hope the person will stay for you for a long, long time. But people still have to move on. And Paul here actually took six verses from verse 23 to 28 to close this letter. And everything that he said actually manifests his deep affections for these early believers. And as we dissect, as we dissect this farewell letter, let's remember that God is the one who has inspired this word and also preserved this word for our benefit as well, not only for the Thessalonians. So let us all contemplate this goodbye letter with personal application in our mind. Don't say it's only for them, but it's for all of us. So it's as much as a letter God is writing to us. And first of all, Paul said and remind them, hey, before I say goodbye, remember God is the one who is faithful. It makes the whole world a difference to know that we have someone who is faithful to us. Now let's take a look at these three verses here, or two verses, 23 and 24. I took it from the New American Standard Version because he elaborated in such a nice way and I think I want to use this NAS version here. He said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus is coming back. Faithful is he who calls you and he will bring it to pass. Now notice the first thing that Paul did was to focus the attention of the Thessalonians reader, the believers, to a living God, not himself. When I go, all the words will say goodbye. I want you to know that there's someone who is faithful to you. I want that when I go, I will tell my children I won't be here, but I want to remind you there is a faithful God who is holding your hand and leading you all the way. And he did it emphatically. You see, look at the sentence here. He began with, may, now may the God of peace himself. You see, by placing the word himself at the front of the sentence, Paul was actually putting the emphasis on God, not me. Leaders will come. Leaders will go. But God is going to be with you. Focus on God, not focus on the human, on God. Paul said emphasize on God. And he wanted the test learned to know that it is the Lord, not me. It is the Lord, not anyone else or anything else would be the direct source of the good work that he is about to listen out in the following words. Indeed, the God of peace would be your provider. And I know the God of peace is going to be with us. You see, in the New Testament, the word peace the word peace here conveys the idea of we think about peace, we think about harmony, we think about friendliness, we think about contentment. It is opposed to the such thing as disorder or confusion or conflict. It is void of irrit irritability, anxiety or impatience in us. And this view of the God of peace that we have is certainly so different from the foreign God or the God in the past. You know, when I was young, my mother brought me to the temple and I was afraid to go to the temple. In the Taoist temple, we see us big and the God looked to be very angry, you know, about to strike me with a knife, you know, and I, or with a hammer in the hand. And I'm very scared. I don't like to go in, you know. It's like, you know, I, I'm, my mom is trying to please. Try to please, a please, and it's insatisfiable. But our God is not like that. You see, we have a God of peace, a truly a God of peace, the Lord of peace. And even in His wrath, that He come uh, in appropriation for our sin, it truly satisfies. By how? By voluntarily sacrificing His own Son. He says, anyone who loves us so much that he sacrificed somebody else. No, 
He sacrificed His own Son for us, whose death on the cross itself provides sufficient pardon for our sin. And when I hear about this God, it changed my heart. Not a God that we keep a pleasing but never satisfied. But here's a God who loved me, you know, and He went to the extent of giving away His own Son. And in order to gain our freedom from sin, and all we need to do is simply to accept by faith the full pardon that God grants us through the blood of His own Son. And there is nothing we can pay to earn it. No. There's no work that we can do or perform that we can earn that salvation. And He just offered us, isn't that awesome? We have a God of peace that made all the way to build a bridge towards us. And Christ, Christ Himself had done it all. And the only thing that He cannot do for us is to accept it by faith. We have to make the choice. He has done everything completely. And that is for us to do it. That is for us to do it. And the close of this letter, if you do not know Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, as your rescuer from your wrath, or as a provider of everlasting peace, don't put him off any longer. God has done everything for us. And all He needs required to do is just accept it by faith. We will never, by our own self, get this lasting peace unless we come and put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. So gain that unfathomable peace as we enter this new year that God longs to give to all of us. Have you have someone that loves us so much and want to give us the very best and still waiting? A lot of people say, oh, chances pass by. Once it's gone, Chinese say, uh, uh, no, if the sheep pass already, you miss it. But God is there patiently waiting for us. Today and right now, the God of peace Ask each one of us, would you want to flood your heart with this joy? The rest of forgiveness that only by faith in Christ can bring. And Paul is again challenging those who have yet made that choice. And today he's speaking to all of us. Have you made that choice? And from God's faithfulness, the focus now move on and turn to God's work. And Paul here actually mentioned that there are three that he prays so hard for God to accomplish among these Thessalonian believers because he loved them so dearly and we prayed that these three things will happen in life. And what are these three things? Let's take a look at these three things. The first thing he prayed that they may have complete sanctification in verse 23 here, he says sanctification. The word sanctify here means to set apart. It means you take that, hey, this is something holy. Put it apart. Not used for anything, set apart. And that's what the word sanctify it means, to set apart. And in the scripture, it has reference to being separated from the root or the fruit of evil. You should not have any association with anything that is wrong, anything that is evil. Because God knows that we are all sinners, we are all saved by grace. And after being saved by grace, we still have this sinful nature inside us, right? And we are struggling every day. Huh? And the devil wants to control us, right? But at the same time, there is also this Holy Spirit inside us. Hey, Will you want to surrender yourself to the old past or you want to surrender to me to the probing, convicting and also the persuading of the Holy Spirit and yielding our life under His control so that we may have an abundant life? 
There is this struggle inside us. And God wanted each one of us to come to complete sanctification. Complete second, day by day, until we meet the Lord face to face. And Paul is praying that this is happening uh, to his beloved brothers and sisters. And so am I. Each day I pray that God will make us holier, holier each day as we learn to yield to the control of the Holy Spirit. You see, by praying for God's complete sanctification, He also prayed for their complete preservation. And I love it. Right? If you ever pray for someone dear to you in our family, this should be your goal. Pray for their sanctification as well as preservation. Paul used the word here. In case that the Thessalonian taught that he was praying for God's sanctification for them by removing them from this world. Some of us think, oh, the only way for us uh, to stay holy and walk holy uh, is to what? Uh, take myself out of this world from all this even from the internet, from the handphone, from the computer. Take away from everything. Therefore, I will become sanctified. And I will live in the monastery, live in the jungle deep inside there with nothing else except rain, water, sunshine, you know. Plant your own food. No, that's not what Paul is talking about. You take a look, he says, he says, may your spirit, soul and body be preserved completely without removing them from this world. You see, the Greek word for the word preserve actually means to watch over. You watch over something. When someone entrusts you something, you watch over. If you're a nanny or somebody, you make sure you take good care of their child, right? When someone passes you something to use, you make sure you watch over, you guard it. And you keep it safe. So when you return it back, it is in good condition. That's what it means here, preserve. And it often implies that you prevent from somebody from stealing it, assaulting us, rob us, or attack us. And from what? And from what or whom would the assault come from? And I think there are only three. First, it could be from the devil himself. Second, if others who are against us. And third is among ourselves. We step this other back. And all of these three is dangerous. The first two is without. The last one is within ourselves. And Paul talked about this. And the request here is God would guard the entire being of every Christian. Not one. Every one of us to every assault of sin, no matter where the source comes from, within or without. And so this presupposes that God intends for Christians to live in this world, not to be taken out of the world. We have to learn to love one another and yet watch out and protect ourselves so that we will not be attacking one another and make sure that no one from out there attack us. And that's what Paul is meaning here. And the Lord promises, even in his prayer, you know, you remember in John chapter 17, 15, Jesus prayed that he will not. Uh, he prayed, he promised that, that he will, uh, he promised that he will insulate his people from the enemy attack and not isolate them, take them out of this world and place them in a perfect condition. No, Jesus never said, she said, when we do that, we become like salt to the earth and light to shine for others. And when we are thinking out, how can we shine? How can we be a salt to this world? We are there to impact them and we are taken out. No, how can the salt impact? How can the light shine? And that's what Paul is talking Complete sanctification and then complete preservation logically lead to the third one that Paul prayed that they may have complete blamelessness. When the Lord Jesus Christ returned for His own people, He said that He will come, and definitely He will come. When? Don't ask me. He will come. That's for sure. He said He will come, mean He will come. And when He will come, we will all stand in the presence of the Lord in our glory, 
totally void of any fault, any condemnation and guilt. And that's the promise. We will all be holy, true and true. Entirely free from penalty and power of the presence of sin. Only Christians have this hope. We who are members of God's family have this wonderful hope and future waiting for us. And you may ask, how can I be certain about it, Pastor? Can I lose this happy ending along the way? Why? Because we are all imperfect. Huh? Why? Because we have a sinful nature in us. We have a tendency of straying away from God. But here, the Bible tells us straight away, at the end of this, faithful is He, He says, faithful is He who calls you and who He will bring it to pass. Isn't it? Every one of us Christians will make it to the end and stand before God to be acceptable. And who did the job? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not us. Whatever is lacking, Christ fill it up for all of us. Isn't that a blessed hope? Isn't that a great prayer that Paul is praying for those he loves? And you know one day he's going to see each one of them. First of all, we have a God that is faithful. And Paul could says, hey, we also have friends. They can be loyal to us. Let's take a look. How can we believers learn to be loyal to one another? Let's take a look with the next two, three verses here that Paul and as a reminder for us. He said, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss and I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. Now in these three verses itself, you notice that the spotlight now moves away from God to God's people. Now the focus is on God's people. And Paul here specified that there are three traits that will characterize what believers should be. What kind of believers? And I will call these qualities of loyal friends. As we are loyal huh? friends to one another, as brothers and sisters, we should acquire all, we should possess all of these three traits. And the first one he mentioned here, which I put in bold letter, he says, hey, as loyal friends, we should be praying for each other. Other, do you pray for each other? Do you have time in the prayer list? Uh, as our list get longer and longer, we pray longer and longer. We got more names added to our list. We will pray for them. Do you have a list of people that you are praying for them? Because this is what we are all supposed to do: to pray for another. As loyal friends, we are all friends here, not the brothers and sisters. Do you spend time? Will you allocate time to pray for one another regularly interceding for one another's behalf before the throne of God's grace? And I encourage you on Wednesday, come join us in prayer. And of course, in your own personal prayer list every morning, you know, don't miss out. Uh, just as much as you want other people to pray for you, you too must learn to pray. That's what loyal friends are. Well, as friends, you remember the person, right? Uh, you spend time. Uh, you call your friend, but never give it even a minute to pray for a person. What kind of friend we are? As loyal friends, we pray for each other. Secondly, as loyal friends, we have to show we are affectionate toward each other. I'm talking affectionate, you know, guys get a little bit shy, you know, being affectionate. Yeah? The exhortation here is actually to greet each other with a holy kiss. And I don't know how I can do that. Uh, but I think here he's talking about simply a reference to actually being demonstrative in your love towards someone. We all use different ways of expression. 
we all have different language, right? Some people language is touch, you know, huh? Some people language is using word. Some people language, you know, huh? Is paying attention, listening. Huh? Some people word, huh? or kind of is saying encouraging word, right? Some people huh, is giving gift. All of us got different language, different way of expressing. So you can expect oh, this person never hug me. Huh? But for the person, uh, hugging is something that's not his style. You must remember, right, according you know, to the culture, in those days, in Paul's time, it was a common thing you know, for men huh, to give each other a hug and then a kiss on the cheek. And I do it now, you know, on a boy, a cheek, you know, I think he will slap me. <laughs> but it's not a culture, right? But to them, the you know, woman, you know, they, they hug and then they kiss, oh, this is okay. Maybe for us today, a handshake, a pat on the back, you know, text a few words to encourage him. You know, send a gift you know, to remind him. You know, and this is one way we can express our affection for one another. We don't have to standardize. You know? I don't go out there and hug everybody. Some people don't like to be hugged, right? So you must respect the person. But whatever way or method of greeting we use, it is an outward expression of our inward affection for another person. Find out what the person's language is and express in a way to encourage the person that you show that he care. By the fact that you pray for the person, tell him, I've been praying for you. In all that we do, the Bible says, uh, it is to be holy without any tinge of immorality. You know what I mean? Uh, what we do, right, is not to take a while of somebody without anything of my Do it. Uh, comfortably. And the third uh, thing that loyal fans can do is to listen to the same truth. Here, Paul's letter was written to all Christians, not just one. He was written to all Christians, not just to the few leaders, but all Christians in Thessalonica. And therefore, he wanted all of them to hear it, read it, Real friends will keep pointing each other back to the Scripture. We have the Word of God. And even challenge each other to actually accurately apply God's Word. Or to challenge each other to seek and understand what God... Hey, come, let's do Bible study together. Let's find out about what God said. Not what you say, not what other people say, not what the pastor say, but what God said to us. We should all be attracted to the truth, to the same truth. And after all, there is no final counsel for a friend to give and to receive from another than to convey the truth of God. That is the most precious gift you can give to someone. We do not have a faithful God. Paul says, remember, we are some loyal friends. And lastly, Paul ends with saying, that, hey, we have grace. Grace that is lasting, not temporary, not circumstantial, but lasting here. And Paul, remember, he began his letter uh, in his word of hello when he greeted them. In chapter 1, verse 1, he said, grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace come with you. And now at the end of the book, when you say goodbye, now he do it another way in reference to grace by stating in verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. When we leave, most confident word they know is, hey, the grace of God is going to be with you. When I bade my son goodbye at the airport, very painful, huh? to let him go to Canada. I always wanted him to stay with me. But then, huh, all sons get married, they will have to follow their wife. Uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, all sons get married, they have to start a new life. Uh, uh, correct myself. They have started, where the Lord leads, they will go. Not follow the parents. The Lord leads them and they say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 
always my mom. Dad and mom is not going to be with you. The grace of my Lord Jesus Christ and that is sufficient for you. Paul encouraged them. Oh, wonderful. You see the root word for the word, grace. You must understand. The word, word grace here you know, has to refer to something, something that produces well-being. Something good is going to come up from God's grace. Nothing rotten. Good. Huh? Like what? Favor. God's favor you. Just as God went with Joseph wherever he went. He doesn't know how dark the dungeon is. How terrible was the road that traveled to Egypt was. How terrible it was to be accused you know, and then locked up in the jail. He said, God's favor is with you. My son, remember that. Huh? The beauty of the Lord with you. Huh? Be thankful in every situation because God is still with you. Kindness is going to be with you. And all benefit of God will be with you. And always remember, grace is something that is undeserved. Not because I'm good. <laughs> no, no, no. It is not something that is, it is something that is immeasurable. I cannot tell you how great it is, but it's going to be great. It's not something you can earn. It is something that you cannot repay. And God will give that to you. So theologically, grace is the favor that God has lovingly, not only lovingly, lavishly and endlessly bestowed on His people who deserve only condemnation and judgment. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Was that any good? No. While we were yet sinners, He came and died for us. That is grace. This unmerited favor of God has been made possible only through our Lord Jesus Christ who willingly took upon himself the judgment on the cross on our behalf. That's grace. If God would do that and give us the best while we don't deserve it, can you imagine that his grace is with you? Isn't that sufficient? And by saying goodbye in this way, I think Paul was telling the reader, hey, remember from this day onward to live in the light of God's grace. Be thankful that when you don't deserve it, God shower His love upon you. I mean, you don't deserve it, God shower His blessing on you so that you have benefit from it. What a way to say goodbye. And the final thoughts, they come from this truth of this whole book, uh, will sum up in this way. First Thessalonians is not just a love letter that Paul wrote to a group of believers in the first century in Thessalonica. It is also a love letter that God is writing to all of us. And He being the divine head of the church to those of us who now, we are all composed to church in our 21st century right now. And this letter is also relevant to us. It's speaking to us. God is using this as a love letter for all of us. Sure, it is Paul who wrote it. But don't forget, it is God who inspired him to write it down, to preserve it in black and white, you know, on the parchment, so that today we all can read this love letter from God. If you receive a love letter from God, please don't just chuck it away. If you receive a love letter from God, it is for us to obey it, not to ignore the message, or to disobey it and ignore God who speaks to us in His precious Word. And on the other hand, for all of us, being submissive to the truth is one concrete way for us to demonstrate our love. Love for who? The author of this book is God. The one who loves us. The one whose grace 
stand by us, and lead us all the way until we meet Him face to face. So let us not walk away this morning from this love letter without taking some essential step in applying the instruction you have given to us. First Thessalonians recorded the pride, the pride and the joy of Paul over his new convert. Yes, he invested a lot of time in the life of these Thessalonians and see the result and the fruit that comes out from the investment. But it's also a love letter for all of us. And let's recall, at least I think we can take home with us as we close this book, you know, and move on to the next one. There are three things, lessons, key lessons that Paul points out for all of us. What are the key lessons? First one, stay connected in loving one another in all our imperfection. We are not perfect. All of us are not. And we still have to love them. Yes, we are imperfect, but God called us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God said, we have to learn. If you see the imperfection, you see our imperfection, you begin to admire the person because the person is more like me, right? <laughs> you see that all oh, the person, if I'm perfect, oh, then there's a problem. You find it very hard. Huh? Because you measure yourself better than our person. You say what? Stay connected in loving in all our imperfection. God put us here for a reason. Right? What you say in a Bible study, iron sharpen iron. God put us together, we can sharpen one another so that we can grow together. Stay connected. Our team for these two years is connected and evangelism. If we are not connected, how to evangelize? If we are biting ourselves, fighting each other, you know, how can we evangelize? Before you talk about evangelism, let's learn to stay connected. Secondly, stay committed. Commit to what? In giving gift that God has given to us to encourage and build up one another. Each one of us got gift. Just now, we just asked you, huh? To use your gift to enlist yourself to build out one another. Don't keep your gift and then put it in the home there and hide it under the bed. Uh, and one day when the Lord Jesus comes, here you are, Lord Jesus, I'll be hiding under the bed, all this gift back to you. It's not for that reason. It's for us to build out one another. So all of us must get connected, get serving in one another. If we want to be contagious in Christ, all of us must do our part. Be committed, be connected, and finally, we need to stay concentrated. Concentrated in our calling and light of the second coming. Jesus is coming soon. We spend the whole book in chapter 4 talking about the resurrection, talking about the rapture that is coming. The day of the Lord is coming and the judgment is coming and the time we have is running out. And when those things are coming, be stay concentrated in where God has placed us to be. I'm called to be a pastor. You may be called to be a lawyer, a teacher, engineers, doctors. Wherever place God place you to be a student, God wants us to be a light to shine for Him. Why the day is coming and we have not much time. Stay concentrated. Don't bother. Don't be like Peter. After Jesus forgive him, give him three times. Do you love me? Do you treat me? Turn around. Hey, how about him, huh? Jesus? How about him, huh? huh? John, huh? John, 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 John Cheong, Bobby Lam, you know, uh, Glenn, you know, uh, uh, Lisa. How, how about them? That's none of our business. Your business is do what God calls us to do. Do your part. Focus. Use your gift. And God will speak to each one of them. Right? concentrated so that we can be effective for the Lord. Don't make everyone like you. They will have the gift and they'll do what they want to do. May the Lord help us as we move on. You enter the new year and we challenge each other to serve and build and encourage one another to build us stronger to become contagious Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for your word. Oh, Father, we thank you for the precious word. Oh, the word that is written thousands of years ago, Lord, to a group of Christians who discovered about your love. A group of Christians who didn't know how to start, but they learned. They learned to be contagious Christians because they held on to your word. They know that, God, you are with them. They know that, Father, they have a group of people with lawyers standing beside them. They know that the grace of God is with them. And for the reason they know that, Lord, that you are there to strengthen them and encourage each one, therefore they become so effective. And I pray, O oh, Father, Lord, that you would do the same for our church now. Lord, we are no different from them. We all come from different backgrounds, with different values in our life. But we have one thing in common. We are all believers. We are all saved by God's grace. We all have been given with gifts of all kinds of gifts so that we be effective in building up the church of God. Help us, Lord, to use the gift that you have given to us so that, Father, Lord, that we can build up one another and become, Lord, a powerful witness for you a powerful encourager for one another and become, Lord, so contagious that people who pass by and see our life meet us will want to be one of us. Oh, Father, not by our own merit, all oh, by God's grace. And I pray, Father, Lord, we seek, Lord, each day in our life to be completely blameless, completely Preserve in the Lord and completely sanctify every day so that, Father, we will walk not only as a light to shine for you, Lord, that we will be an instrument of blessing wherever we go. Oh, Father, we thank you for this precious words. And I commit all of us who are believers this morning to Him that when God speaks, we listen. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. And when God speaks to us, Father, we respond and we take action. And that is the outward expressions of our inward love for you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, this morning. And I commit all of us here in the hand. And this, Father, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all arise. Now unto Him who is able to keep, able to keep you from falling, and to sanctify faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God. Our Savior, be glory and majesty, the wisdom and power, both now and forever. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father. And the our presence of the Holy Spirit be with us as we live each day in fulfilling what God, Lord, has intended for each one of us. In whatever post, Lord, that you put us, whatever stations where we have placed us to be, Father, let us be, Lord, a light to shine for you. Let us be a channel of blessing to others. And this, Father, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And after a silent moment of meditation, we are dismissed.